Hi everyone and welcome back to Philosophy of the Paranormal with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. So today I've decided to alter my plans for this week ever so slightly. Initially I planned for the first lecture of this week to be the UFO and Alien Life lecture. Uh, now I want to give myself just a little bit more prep time because I'm changing this lecture up uh, somewhat substantially compared to the lecture on the same topic that I offered last year, the previous time that I taught this course. Uh, and this is mainly because, um, as I've mentioned, you know, here and there, um, the United States government uh, has uh, made available an unclassified report um, from uh, national security in the United States on unidentified aerial phenomena, UAPs. Uh, which encompasses what we would have traditionally called uh, UFOs, Unidentified Flying Objects. So, the readings for that class will actually be fairly light. Um, the report on UFOs um, is only nine pages long, um, and it's not very dense. Uh, so, it's not going to be a lot of reading. Um, and I think what I'll do for next time is probably do um, a bit of a close reading uh, with you. You know, we'll kind of have our, our copies of the report, and I'll kind of walk through the report um, and sort of present my take on it. I'll also have you watch a documentary, uh, which touches on the subjects of UFOs and alien life. So the readings will be fairly light. But uh, because the lecture is going to be very different from the kind of thing I did last year, I wanted to give myself a little bit more time. So for that reason, today, instead of talking about aliens and UFOs, I'll do the second lecture that I had planned for week four, and that is astrology and horoscopes. Also something to do with uh, space, I guess, uh, similar to aliens. Um, also an interesting topic to discuss. Uh, I enjoy talking about this because when I was an undergrad, astronomy was actually my favorite class, other than philosophy, of course. Uh, so I had a lot of fun there, uh, learning about uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about with you today. Now, of course, I'm no astronomer, but I do have sufficient background to uh, kind of lay out the differences between astrology and astronomy why astronomy uh, astro astronomy <laughs> why astronomy is a science and astrology is not and why astrology probably does not work it probably doesn't do what astrologers believe it does um, uh, and so on and so forth so we'll take a look at astrology and horoscopes today another bit of housekeeping I suppose that I should get out of the way uh, this is not really anything that important. Um, but you'll be happy to know, uh, with this change of plans, uh, that the readings are very, very light, right? As I mentioned, um, the only reading you'll have for my aliens and UFOs lecture will be the nine-page report, and then you can watch a documentary, which will be fun uh, if, if, if you're like me and you find old-school documentaries kind of fun. Uh, today, for today's lecture on astrology and horoscopes, there are no readings whatsoever. So uh, I know we've been reading a lot of um, kind of dense stuff in this class. So this week, there's barely any readings. Uh, and then next week, when we talk about the uncanny, we'll get back into the readings. But we've got a little bit of a break from our readings this week. So, so with all of that said, let's dive into today's topic, astrology and horoscopes. Let's talk about what astrology is what horoscopes are, what astrology is meant to be all about, how is it different from astronomy, and why is astronomy a science and astrology is not a science, it's a pseudoscience. Why are they different in this way? That's what we're going to be learning about today. Not only will you have uh, light readings this week, uh, but uh, the next couple of lectures will probably be a little bit shorter than usual. Um, and that's just because, um, you know, I'm having you watch something else uh, in addition to my lecture, right? Um, but uh, in any case, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Uh, 
will probably take a little bit less time to get through this material today. What I'll do is I will explain astrology and horoscopes and break everything down in such a way as to clarify what the difference is between the pseudoscience of astrology and the science of astronomy are, what all of the differences are exactly. Um, and then I've got a bit of a treat for everyone, and I hope you'll enjoy this as much as I did when I watched it as an undergraduate. So skeptics and astronomy nerds uh, in this class uh, are probably familiar with the work of the astronomer Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan um, was a very heavy-hitting figure in planetary astronomy and in science education and popularization. Um, he was uh, just probably, I, I would say that he's got to be the best science communicator uh, who ever lived. Um, he's just, he just had a knack for not only communicating science, um, but for uh, lighting that spark of curiosity um, that makes you want to know more about how nature works. And his enthusiasm for the subject matter that he talks about is just infectious in this way. Um, and he wrote this book. Uh, this is, I believe, a first edition. I have several copies of this, uh, different editions, but I picked this one at, a few years ago at the Great Glebe Garage Sale here in Ottawa for $2 uh, in a church basement. Uh, so this is a really great find. It's uh, illustrated. It's got lots of wonderful pictures. Uh, really great, uh, really great book. Really awesome. Great to have on your coffee table to discuss with your nerdy friends. Anyway, um, this book accompanied a 13-part documentary series, which aired in the 1980s, uh, called Cosmos, A Personal Voyage. This is the book version. Uh, but today, uh, following this lecture, I will have you watch a, uh, an episode of this PBS series that was made in 1980. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably like, why are we watching this old-timey documentary? It's all old and silly, and the, the music and, and the, 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 the way that the filming is done, it's all very old, and you know, why are we watching this? Well, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, as I said, um, Sagan is probably the best science communicator who ever lived. Um, I, would, I would argue that uh, to anybody. So, um, he is, uh, he's the guy. He's the astronomer uh, who knows about astronomy and astrology. He's the guy. He died in 1996, unfortunately, so uh, did not live to see the um, uh, space-faring uh, space, uh, advantages of uh, the present day. You know, now that we, now uh, space shuttles have been retired for some, some years, um, Space flight is uh, kind of moved into private contracting, you know, so you have, uh, of course, SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic and all of these companies. He didn't live to see any of this, but um, most of what he says in this documentary um, is still um, agrees with um, the most cutting-edge data that we have about the universe. So, the documentary is aged. Uh, but it is still um, a trusty source of knowledge in many regards. Uh, and of course, um, you know, you might, again, you're probably wondering, why don't we watch something newer? Why don't we watch something by Neil deGrasse Tyson? Uh, Carl Sagan was Neil deGrasse Tyson's astronomy teacher. So, you know, we're, we're, we're going old school here. Anyway, when you watch this, what I want you to do is focus on the way Sagan does what he does. In this episode that we're going to watch, called uh, Harmony of the Worlds, um, he talks a lot about uh, the reasons why astrology is a pseudoscience, uh, but he does not just do that. And this is the important thing. This is, this is like the takeaway, I think, a great example of something we discussed last time when we talked about anomalistic psychology and we read Jones and Zisney's paper. Sagan does not just debunk. He doesn't just, you know, hand wave. Um, he tells you why a particular idea is wrong, and then explains 
the, 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 the better idea, the, the best hypothesis or the best theory that we have. And he does it in a way that makes uh, the truth of how the universe works more interesting and more beautiful um, than any pseudoscientific pseudo account could make it seem. Um, so he's not just debunking, uh, he's taking an honest look at some of these claims and telling us, the viewer, why the real answer is far more compelling and far more fascinating. And that is something that has stuck with me through the years. And something that I think, if you haven't seen this kind of thing, that you need to experience for yourself. So that's why I'm having you watch this, you know, old uh, public television documentary about space. Um, and I think you'll see, if you watch the episode, I think you will see what I mean when you finish the episode. Anyway, before that, um, or maybe you've already watched it, I don't know, if you have, that's fine. Uh, but uh, what I want to do now is talk about the differences between astronomy and astrology and kind of clarify some of the things that are actually left out in this documentary. Some of the technical aspects of astrology and astronomy that it would be helpful for you to know, to digest, the, the, uh, to digest this episode of Cosmos. So, uh, let's get into it. Now, I'm sure all of you are familiar with each of these terms, astronomy and astrology. We've all heard of astronomy, uh, the study of uh, stuff in space, you know, stars and all of that uh, cool stuff all out there in the universe. That's astronomy, of course. And astrology, uh, you've all heard of that as well, whether you believe it in astrology or not. You know, we see uh, astrology columns in newspapers and magazines. Uh, probably now you're more likely to see articles about... Uh, astrology and perhaps your zodiac or your your uh, your weekly horoscope online uh, in those uh, you know kind of listicle article things maybe um, you may even uh, have seen like astrology apps uh, I haven't uh, I haven't used anything like that but I'm sure that they exist um, so we've all heard of them and as we talked about when we first got into this class we really got going and talking about belief in the paranormal we saw, um, you know, in some of Blackmore's chapters, and again later on in the Jones and Zisney paper, that many people uh, still believe in astrology. Um, but we saw, especially when we looked at Jones and Zisney, that uh, high belief, uh, it tends to come with uh, higher technical knowledge of that domain, but not necessarily. So I'm going to try and, um, I guess, uh, raise your knowledge and maybe lower your belief a little bit. I don't know. I hope that's ethical. But anyway, what is astronomy precisely? Well, the word astronomy comes from the Greek words astra, which means star, and nomos, which means like uh, an order or uh, like a law, like a law-like order, right? So astronomers study natural phenomena in the universe. We're talking stars, which are giant balls of gas, right? We're talking planets. Uh, bodies that orbit stars. We're talking nebulae, like uh, a nebula is a big uh, bunch of gas and dust out there in the universe, and usually um, it'll collapse and stars will be born there one day. And they study other interesting celestial phenomena as well, and there are many different kind of like subdivisions in astronomy. You know, as I mentioned earlier, Sagan was a um, planetary astronomer. That's where he did a lot of his uh, graduate student research. In fact, he did it on the planet Venus and the greenhouse effect on the planet Venus. So, um, there's many different areas of astronomy. And astronomy really emerged as a proper science during the uh, scientific revolution in Europe. Uh, I say proper in the sense that we finally started to include things like experimentation and you know, parsimony and, and, you know, those key tenets of natural science. Um, but it was very systematic even before this, okay? So don't get me wrong. Uh, indeed, um, when Europe uh, was in the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages, you know, I don't know how dark it actually was, but um, in the Dark Ages, the so-called Dark Ages, before the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment in Europe, um, a lot of the astro astronomical knowledge of the world, which would eventually make its way to the West, um, was kind of being, uh, you know, a, a lot of that work, a lot of the preservation and building up 
further of this astronomical knowledge was done in the Arabic world, in uh, Dar al-Islam, or the home of Islam. Uh, especially in Baghdad, where we had the Bayt al-Hikmah, the House of Wisdom. This was a big library uh, that was, um, I believe, um, commissioned, um, construction and collection of materials was commissioned by uh, Harun al-Rashid, who was the caliph at the time. And uh, he wanted to collect all of this knowledge. Um, so he had the House of Wisdom, uh, people would study there, all kinds of scholars from all over the world. And a lot of uh, knowledge was preserved there. And before that, you know, these Arabic scholars had borrowed from er even earlier sources, from, from Greek astronomy, from Persian astronomy, uh, ancient Indian, of course, uh, Babylonian astronomy. Uh, all were borrowed uh, by Arabic scholars and then subsequently European scholars. Um, so astronomy became a fully fledged science starting in the scientific revolution when we finally had figures like Kepler and Newton and Galileo uh, positing natural laws and theories that would explain like the motions of heavenly bodies and whatnot. But as you'll see in the documentary, all ancient human societies had some kind of astronomical knowledge or expertise. And they had to in order to survive. They had to do this in order to reckon time, um, to understand when the seasons were coming and going. Uh, it was very important. It was a matter of survival to be able to reckon time. And the way that we used to do that was the sky, because things in the sky move regularly, for the most part. So what is astrology? Well, astra, you remember astra, the Greek word for star. That's where that part of the word astrology comes from. And also logos, which is an ancient Greek word that can mean many different things. It usually means uh, reason, uh, maybe logic, true speech, uh, language, um, or the study of. That's what it means in this case. And it just so happens that up until the scientific revolution, you know, when we were finally able to begin positing natural laws uh, to explain the motions of heavenly bodies and, you know, appealing to things like uh, forces like gravitation and so forth. Before that, astronomy and astrology were the same discipline. So the, the roots of astrology actually go back to the same calendrical systems uh, that ancient peoples all around the world used in order to reckon time and, you know, know when to plant crops and when to harvest and when to travel and so on and so forth, when to, when to meet with others of their community and so on. Uh, so uh, basically it all goes back to the same calendrical systems that use the stars and the moon. Now, presently, astronomy is a science. Um, it's practiced by many, many scientists. Um, uh, and astronomy, uh, or astrology, I should say, is regarded as a pseudoscience, something that may appear scientific, uh, you know, because it involves measurements and records and observation and things like that, but that doesn't do any of the things that's really important for science, like replication, uh, create claims that are potentially falsifiable and then try and falsify them through experimentation, uh, parsimony, rec replicability, all these things are absent in astrology, which is why it is considered a pseudoscience. And basically what astrology tries to do is to divine information about a person's life. It could be their present circumstances or their, their future circumstances, their, their fate, if you like. Um, from the motions and positions of certain celestial objects at the moment of one's birth. So that's what astrology tries to do. Now, um, I just want to note uh, that I'm focused mostly on Western astrology today. Western astrology is the kind of thing that you, you, know, you open a newspaper and you see the, the horoscopes, or maybe you call an astrologer and have them do a very detailed horoscope for you. This is Western astrology, and it originated in Mesopotamia, and spread to Greece, eventually to Rome, and into the Arab world, um, and then back into Europe, in uh, European Christendom, and then uh, the uh, scientific revolution would get underway uh, sometime after that. But, of course, there are other astrological systems. I mentioned the ancient Indian uh, traditions earlier. I don't know much about their 
system of astrology, but they certainly had a very, very sophisticated one that probably influenced, um, you know, the Persians and the Babylonians and, and whatever before the uh, before before this knowledge became part of the Arab world. Um, so uh, also China, um, China also has its own unique kind of astrology system and we can see this today you know if you look at a horoscope in a newspaper you'll see western astrological signs western zodiac signs but you'll probably be familiar with the chinese calendar uh you know year of the tiger year of the dragon and, and so forth this is from the ancient chinese system which is different from the western system so there are other systems out there i just want you all to be aware of that but I'm going to be focusing on the Western system today, just because that is what I am familiar with. Now, as I mentioned before, astrology is not a science. Uh, it is actually a kind of divination. What is divination? Well, divination is a means of uh, attempting to gather information uh, from a divine source or a supernatural source. And in this case, it is the celestial objects that are, I suppose supposed to be divine. So divination also covers things like dowsing and tarot card reading, um, but uh, in this case, you know, uh, we're sticking to astrology. But astrology is a form of divination. It seeks to gather information via divine or supernatural means. I mean, think about it. This makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, uh, think of the planets. The planets are important in astrology. Which um, zodiacal sign or which constellation the planets are in at the moment of your birth is supposed to have an impact on your life, according to astrology. And I'll get into this in more detail later. But basically, the planets used to be uh, considered gods, right? Uh, planet, uh, by the way, comes from the Greek word planetos, which means uh, wanderer, right? So... The planets are wanderers, and we'll get into why that is, but basically it's because stars rotate uh, around the celestial poles, um, uh, and they kind of move, uh, they kind of, you know, don't really do anything surprising, right? But through the year, planets will exhibit something called retrograde motion, which has to do with a kind of um, perspective change from the Earth and the other planet orbiting the sun. Uh, Carl Sagan explains this in the documentary, actually. Uh, but uh, planets used to be thought of like gods or beings in the sky. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe which constellation the planet is in when you're born is a way to divine information if the planets are gods, right? Uh, the planets actually, by the way, in our solar system are mostly, uh, they're named after um, Roman gods. Moons are named after... Uh, Greek gods, um, and most stars actually have uh, Arabic names. So there's some interesting historical reasons why this is the case. Uh, uh, a lot of the stars have Arabic names because that was the kind of astronomy that was going on uh, in the Arabic world uh, at the time, during the kind of uh, golden age of Islam, when all this science was happening in Baghdad at the House of Wisdom. There was a lot of astronomy going on there, uh, and that's why uh, stars today have Arabic names, because uh, that knowledge eventually made its way to Europe and kind of kicked off the European scientific revolution in a way. Um, so we have stars in the sky we can see from here, like uh, Rigel or Betelgeuse. You know, these are Arabic names, whereas planets, uh, Jupiter, Mars, these are Roman names. And moons, uh, like... Uh, Mars' moons, Phobos and Deimos, well, those are Greek names. So, interesting. Okay, so there's a few things you'll want to know about astrology uh, to really understand it, how it's supposed to work and why it probably doesn't work. Uh, you'll want to know about the celestial sphere, for example, and I'll put a, an image here, which is from planetariescience.org. You can visit that, uh, or you can check out this picture, or you can see it on uh, slide number six in our PowerPoint slides. But anyway, astronomers, astrologers, um, even um, even navigators before the advent of like radar and GPS and whatnot would use a celestial sphere. What is a celestial sphere? Well, it's kind of like a three-dimensional map of the entire sky as seen from the planet Earth. 
And the Earth is at the center. So you can see here the Earth is at the center. And, you know, if you were to look up in the night sky and see your section of the sky, wherever you are on Earth, uh, that would be the part of the celestial sphere uh, that you can see from your vantage point on Earth. Um, now, the Earth, of course, uh, orbits the Sun, and it also uh, rotates on its axis. So, uh, you know, and by the way, I've been pretty tolerant of a lot of anomalistic beliefs in this class, but I hope there are no flat Earthers here, because you're going to have a hard time with this lecture. Anyway, the Earth turns around its axis. You can see here its axis is there's a line uh, going through the middle of the planet that starts at the south celestial pole and goes through the middle and goes to the north celestial pole. Um, that's the Earth's axis, and the Earth rotates around that. That's why we have day and night, right? Because we're rotating, rotating once every 24 hours. So um, at night, the stars appear to rotate around the North Celestial Pole. And you can see this if you go out, you know, why not tonight if the sky is clear? You can find the North Star, Polaris, uh, which actually marks the North Celestial Pole. And you can find this by, uh, you can download apps like sky, sky mapping apps that will help you find it. Or uh, you can uh, find, uh, you can find it by going, uh, let's see where we are, about 46 degrees north latitude here in Ottawa. So if you're in Ottawa, you can just uh, try and look 46 degrees up in, from horizon in the sky and uh, you can find it that way. Um, or there's another easier way to find it. So if you don't want to go looking um, for angles, you don't have a sextant or any kind of uh, astronomical tools like that, there's an easier way to find Polaris. Basically, you need to look for the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. These are constellations in the northern sky that you can see. And uh, the very last star on the handle of the Little Dipper is Polaris. Uh, and the two stars of the scoop of the Big Dipper, if you were to draw a line uh, between those two stars, they would actually point up to the handle of the Little Dipper and they'd point at Polaris. And if you go out at night, you find the star, take note of where the constellations are, go back inside, do something else, and go outside a few hours later, you'll find that all the constellations have kind of rotated like this around Polaris, and that's because the Earth is turning. The Earth is rotating on its axis. So, a couple important things there. The celestial sphere, which is like a map of the sky visible from Earth around Earth, with the Earth at the center, the Earth is orbiting uh, the Sun, and it's turning on its axis, right? A few other things that you'll want to know about to really understand what astrology and astronomy uh, kind of once had in common with one another. Uh, you'll need to know about the ecliptic and about the celestial equator. So I'll put another image up here which illustrates those. We still have a celestial sphere here in this picture you can see, but what is emphasized is the celestial equator and the ecliptic. Also shown here is the Earth's uh, you know, orbiting of the sun, although not to scale. That's not something we had in our last one. But you can see the celestial sphere. This is just from Wikipedia, by the way, if you want to go and take a look there. But basically, um, you know, Earth is orbiting around the sun, and it's rotating on its axis, and as a result, it appears from our perspective on Earth that the sun traces a path um, against the celestial sphere, throughout the entire year. And this path through the celestial sphere that the sun takes, or appears to take, because, you know, it's all really just because of the way things are moving and our perspective on Earth, this path is called the ecliptic. And the ecliptic is different from the celestial equator. The celestial equator, likewise, goes around the celestial sphere, uh, but the celestial, gray, uh, the celestial equator is 90 degrees perpendicular to the Earth's uh, equator. So, basically, the North Celestial Pole, or from, it's not per, no, sorry, <laughs> I got that mixed up. So the Celestial Qu Equator is 90 degrees perpendicular from the Celestial Poles, right? So if you were to visualize, you know, something along the lines of this, uh, the ecliptic, if it's, if it's just flat, the celestial equator is going to be kind of angled. Uh, it's going to be 23.4 degrees angled because that is, 
you know, from the uh, the true ecliptic north pole. Uh, that's the difference from there to the north celestial pole, right? If this sounds confusing, I mean, this this visual aid here should clear things up for you. So that path around the sphere uh, that's perpendicular or 90 degrees from the poles is the celestial equator, but the path the sun takes around the sphere is called the ecliptic, and uh, they are not the same path, right? They're kind of off. It looks a little like a gyroscope or something, right? Now, uh, the sun goes around the ecliptic, but during the equinoxes, so we have on Earth, we have the vernal equinox, or the spring equinox, and the autumnal equinox. Uh, during these equinoxes, um, the sun actually crosses the celestial equator. So, and this is why the day, day and night are the same uh, length on the equinoxes, right? Um, we're kind of getting halfway between the shortest day of the year and the longest day of the year when we hit one of these equinoxes. Now, when you talk about astrology, not so much astronomy, uh, but astrology, you hear about the zodiac and the zodiacal signs. And now I can finally explain just what the heck the zodiac actually is, because a lot of people don't know. Where do these zodiacal signs come from? Well, um, the zodiac refers to all of the constellations on the celestial sphere that fall within the ecliptic, or the sun's path around the celestial sphere. So in that ecliptic, there are a certain number of constellations. And constellations, of course, are groups of stars. Earlier I mentioned the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper, by the way, is not in the ecliptic. But the stars in the zodiac, the, the, the constellations they belong to, um, they are in the ecliptic. Um, that's what the zodiac is. So think of constellations not just as groups of stars, but also areas of the sky in the celestial sphere. If you think of the celestial sphere as, uh, as a map, analogous to a map of, of the Earth, like a globe, then the constellations on the celestial sphere uh, would be a bit like the different areas on the map, like countries and oceans and seas and so forth, right? Um, so a constellation isn't just a group of stars, it also delineates an area of the sky within the celestial sphere. And you can see them all in this image, all of the constellations of the zodiac, and of course they'll all be familiar to you, especially if you know about astronomy. We have, or astrology, I should say, we have, you know, Leo, Cancer, Taurus, Capricorn, all of those zodiacal signs are drawn from the names of constellations that appear in the zodiac. And the zodiac uh, is, is just those constellations uh, that the sun uh, passes through when it goes around the ecliptic. Okay, so that's, that's what the zodiac is. Here, of course, I've got some more zodiacal signs. Uh, you can see them all here, uh, and all of the uh, dates... Uh, because remember, all of this really uh, used to just be a calendrical system. This was a way to keep time, right? And that's why there are certain dates associated with certain zodiacal signs. So if you are born between uh, these dates, then you are uh, an Aries or a Virgo or a Sagittarius or something, right? So uh, what astrologers do is they use this information to construct horoscopes. Astronomers only use this for, you know, like if you're like doing some backyard astronomy and you want to know where something is in the sky. That's what astronomers would use this for. It was much more important back in the day. Now, of course, we have like the Hubble telescope, the James Webb telescope, the very large array. We don't have the Arecibo array anymore, unfortunately, but we've got all these uh, optical and radio telescopes we can use. But back in the day when we didn't have that, this is what astronomers would use to kind of talk about where stuff in the sky was so that you could go and find it. And also keeping time and also navigating. You know, if you wanted to sail, for example, you would have to use this information to help you navigate as well. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this lecture, but you can check out my Clockwork Universe uh, lecture from another class I did, and I talk a little bit about that in that lecture if you're interested. But astronomers, uh, that's what they do. Astrologers, they don't do that. Astrologers use information from the Zodiac to construct what is called a horoscope. You've probably seen this again. You know, you've probably seen your horoscope in a newspaper or a magazine or perhaps online. 
Proper horoscopes, though, not like the ones you read in um, newspapers and whatnot, are really uh, like, uh, like star charts uh, or snapshots of where the sun and the moon and all the planets are in the zodiac at the moment of your birth. So that's what they are. So they map, you know, the relation uh, of the sun and the moon and all of the planets in the solar system to the zodiac for the moment you're born. And uh, these um, relative positions of these celestial bodies is supposed to, on astrology, um, reveal important information about, say, your life, your fate, your character, perhaps a decision that you're facing. Uh, again, it's a, it's a kind of divination. So, does astrology actually work? Can we actually divine information uh, from these star charts that show the location of the sun and the moon and all the planets in the zodiac at the moment of one's birth? Well, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, astrology probably doesn't work. And there are many reasons for thinking this to be the case, right? One is that we still base uh, our, um, you know, uh, zodiacal stuff, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say we, I say astrologers still base their uh, their zodiacs, uh, their horoscopes, all of this on the way things had initially been set up in the ancient Middle East. But it's been a long time since then. And the Earth, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, the Earth rotates on an axis. So it's not like straight up and down. It's slanted a little bit. But not only that, but, you know, it also wobbles like this, like a top, over very long stretches of time, thousands and thousands of years. So... Um, enough time has passed since, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Babylonians were, uh, coming up with this stuff that our, uh, you know, uh, current horoscopes are actually off by an entire sign. Um, but astrologers don't really, you know, make a big deal out of this. Uh, they still use, uh, the system that would have worked, uh, a thousand or two thousand years ago, but which is actually off now. So even if you believe in astrology, you should be concerned that um, most astrologers are actually using, um, you know, a system that is still, you know, like a thousand years out of date and thereby off by one whole sign. So that's one reason to doubt that astrology uh, works. You can check out a better explanation of this uh, in a quick video I've linked um, from Bill Nye the Science Guy. I don't know if any of you watched Bill Nye the Science Guy, but I did when I was a kid. And guess what else? Carl Sagan, Bill Nye the Science Guy's astronomy teacher. Pretty cool. Also something that Sagan mentions in the episode that you'll watch is that we can do um, studies on twins uh, to see if astrological predictions are, are accurate. You know, if, if, if astrology works, then twins who are born under the same conditions, the same zodiacal, planetary, stellar conditions at around the same time, you know, just minutes from one another, should have the same fate, you'd think, or the same characteristics, uh, the same personality, the same, you know, whatever. Um, the, the astrology should, should, should predict that those two will be very similar, which of course they are, they're twins, uh, but also that they will have very similar lives, very similar fates. Uh, of course, this uh, is disproven uh, by cases where, you know, twins who perhaps are separated at birth uh, and one will go on to live to a ripe old age while another might be killed in childhood, you know. So this is one example that Carl Sagan provides. Um, so... Twin studies also kind of uh, cast a bit of doubt on astrological predictions because uh, twins shouldn't have such different fates if astrology is true. Uh, it shouldn't be the case that one twin goes on to live a prosperous life and the other is destitute, or one lives to an old age and one dies young. It shouldn't happen. Uh, yet there are very many cases of this happening, of twins who are separated at birth and uh, they have different lives like this, and astrology doesn't account for this. Also, you know, um, the planets, the constellations, uh, they used to be regarded as divine, perhaps as beings in the sky, perhaps gods, right? Um, but constellations, 
the way we see them only appear the way they do because of our vantage point from the Earth. Um, if we viewed them from another world, like thousands of light years away, they would look completely different. The, the night sky on you know, planet X a thousand light years away is completely different from the night sky on Earth. It would have a completely different celestial sphere. If we were to map the sky, we would have a different looking celestial sphere and a different zodiac. So, um, you know, we wouldn't recognize these constellations that we recognize on Earth. You know, if we were on this other planet, we wouldn't recognize them at all. We'd have completely different constellations. Will those different constellations have an impact on the lives of people from planet X? I don't think so. Moreover, you know, the constellations seem static. They seemed static to our ancestors. You know, the sky doesn't really change. Other than uh, supernovas and comets, um, ancient people didn't notice very many changes in the sky. And when a supernova or a comet would appear, it was often, like, taken as, a, you know, a, a, a sign of doom, you know, the sign of the end of the world or something like that. So, you know, the sky is very static. If something happens, like if a comet appears or a supernova appears, the gods must be mad, right? We've done something to upset them. So the sky seems to be static for the most part. But really, the sky is a dynamic place. It's just that we live such short lives that we do not see how the sky changes. So stars change, they live and die. Um, over time, in thousands of years, the constellations, even as we see them from Earth, will look different. We may even have to redraw the map of the celestial sphere, right? Um, and constellations are, uh, you know, the, 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 they, they, the stars in them have their own lives. So, yeah. So I guess the takeaway here is constellations are not like discrete, unchanging entities in the sky. They're just arbitrary lines on a map that we draw. Um, and they're not unchanging. Um, you can check out another quick video from Sagan from a different part of the Cosmos documentary series below. I'll link it in the description. But basically, uh, he talks about constellations as viewed from the Earth versus as viewed from somewhere else. And when you start to look at constellations for what they really are, it becomes hard to fathom how they could affect us, or how a planet being visible in one could affect us. Because, of course, the constellations or the stars that make them up are really thousands of light years away, and planets are only, uh, you know, astronomical units away, much smaller unit of measurement than a light year. There's also probably a pretty big psychological element at play here, and um, uh, to get you, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of show you this, uh, this is an experiment I would actually love to do in this class the next time I'm able to teach it in person. But for now, we have to watch some other people doing it. We're going to watch a video of James Randi, remember, James the Amazing Randi, the, the uh, magician, uh, who does an interesting experiment in a college classroom with some horoscopes. So pause this video now and go watch that experiment below. All right, now that you've seen this video, what, what the heck is going on here? Well, just to summarize and recap, uh, all of the people in this class received the same horoscope, okay? But before they were told this, or before, before this was revealed, they believed that each of them had had a unique horoscope constructed for them, you know, based upon their, their zodiacal information, right? So everyone in this classroom is thinking they've got, you know, they've given their date of birth, their star sign and whatever, and someone's constructed an individual horoscope for them. They've all opened it up and they all, many of them agree like, oh yes, this seems to uh, fit uh, the description of me and my life and what's going on and what I'm concerned about and so on and so forth. Then everybody passes their horoscope to the next one, and surprise, surprise, everyone got the same horoscope. And nonetheless, um, a lot of people agreed uh, that they were accurate horoscopes until they found out that everyone had received the exact same one. So what happened here? Uh, probably some confirmation bias, right? The people who believed in astrology were likely to pick out the information in their horoscopes. Uh, that applied to them and forget about everything that didn't. And there was enough there in this horoscope that everyone thought it could have been their unique individual horoscope. Um, 
So, you know, this is another case of what we might say, like, we're remembering the hits and forgetting the misses, remembering the accuracies in the horoscope and ignoring what is not accurate. Um, so, yeah, um, maybe they attended to parts of their horoscope and remembered the bits that were salient. Um, forget the stuff that doesn't matter. That could be what's going on here. Uh, there are probably other factors besides confirmation bias at play here. Um, but... You know, I don't want to go into too much uh, detail there. I will just remind you that, as we read in Blackmore and in Jones and Zisney, uh, people that um, express higher levels of belief in other paranormal or esoteric belief tend to also believe in astrology quite highly. So, um, you know, belief in the paranormal in general is a predictor of high belief in astrology. Um, so if you were a believer, if you are a believer in astrology, um, consider some of the things I've said here and consider further that, you know, the thing that really separates astronomy from astrology, which you'll see in the documentary, is that astronomy tries to um, identify and test natural laws, uh, theories, hypothesis. Uh, all of these have to be potentially falsifiable. Uh, we, we need principles like parsimony. Uh, we need to try and replicate studies. Um, there's got to be peer review. None of this happens in astrology, and that's why astrology is a pseudoscience. Another reason why astrology is a pseudoscience is because astrology does not identify these law-like relations uh, among heavenly bodies the way uh, astronomy does. So an astrologer could tell you that, you know, Mars um, signifies a confrontational personality, and if it rises in such and such a constellation at the moment of your birth, that you'll be a confrontational person. Why? How to explain that? Well, really, uh, just because Mars is named after a war god. Uh, Mars is named after the god Mars, the Roman god of war, who was the Roman counterpart of Ares. Uh, and the Greeks also associated the planet Mars with a sort of warlike temperament, right? I don't know. Maybe because it appears red from Earth. Who knows? Beyond that, an astrologer cannot offer the kind of explanation, uh, the kind of natural, principled, law-like explanations that astronomers can for celestial phenomena. And that is why astrology is a pseudoscience. All right, so now that I've covered a lot of the background uh, that's not in this documentary related to astrology, um, you'll have a, enough of a background yourself, if you didn't before, to, I guess, have a better appreciation of Sagan's assessment of astrology as a pseudoscience. So what Sagan does in this documentary briefly, in this episode, is he, he, uh, he just very briefly discusses astrology. Um, as I mentioned... Uh, that's why I've spent so much time trying to give you the background for it. Then he discusses uh, what I said a little bit about today, ancient people's reliance on astronomical knowledge, you know, understanding the stars and the planets and their motions in order to reckon time and things like that. And then he discusses the life of Johannes Kepler, who was um, a leading figure in the scientific revolution in Europe, uh, who identified the laws of planetary motion. Now, uh, as I said earlier... You know, keep in mind that Sagan is not just debunking or, you know, waving away astrology like this. Um, he does spend little time talking about it. Uh, That's why I provided this background in this lecture. Instead, what he focuses most on is the story of uh, Kepler, uh, who was a, a very strong believer in astrology. And he was also a bit of a Pythagorean in terms of how he understood geometry and the solar system. And you know, at the time, um, the view was that um, we lived in a geocentric solar system. That is, the Earth was at the center and the Sun went around the Earth. Um, of course, Copernicus, uh, <clears throat> by re, uh, sort of uh, repopularizing an idea from ancient Greece, actually, I think it was Aristarchus or Anaximander who came up with this idea. I don't know the, I don't know the precise ancient Greek thinker, but uh, Copernicus uh, revived this idea, and that was the idea of the heliocentric solar system. The heliocentric solar system has the sun in the center and all of the planets orbiting around it. Um, Kepler, um, together with figures like Galileo and Tycho Brahe, 
was instrumental in establishing that the heliocentric model was the right model, uh, and that the sun was at the center of the solar system, and the earth and the other planets went around the sun, and not the other way around. Um, on the on the on the geocentric model, this was a model that went all the way back to a Greek uh, a Greek naturalist named Ptolemy, uh, who uh, came up with a, a geocentric model with all these intricate celestial spheres. And Copernicus's heliocentric model worked just as well, but it was simpler. This is parsimony. Remember, we're talking about parsimony has to be an important part of science. Occam's razor. In Ptolemy's model, you have the Earth at the center and all these weird invisible spheres making everything work to explain the motions of the planets that we observe in the sky. The heliocentric model required none of that. It was much simpler, and we could gather evidence for it, and eventually, thanks to figures like Kepler, describe the law-like interactions between all the planets and the Sun in the solar system. So that's very powerful. Now, as you watch this documentary, it would be a good idea to reflect on a couple of things. Um, if you do believe in astrology, do you think, having watched this lecture and, and the documentary, that your knowledge of astrology has changed? Um, if your knowledge has changed, you know, maybe you feel you know a bit more about how astrology is supposed to work, um, or how it seems to work, you know, uh, have your beliefs in it changed at all? That would be interesting to hear about. If you don't believe in astrology, did you already know how it was supposed to work, or did you just not believe in it? Did you not believe it worked without knowing how it was supposed to work? Hmm. Now here, uh, you know, basically what we're doing is, uh, with astronomy, it, it's a science, it, it relies on naturalistic principles, uh, parsimony, falsification, um, observation, testing your theories with experimentation. Astrology doesn't, and that's why astrology is not a science, and astronomy is. And astronomy, you know, um, or in any natural science, we're all about naturalistic explanations. But with astrology, we get a little bit of this view of this, you know, this kind of animistic view of the universe, which is something that we're going to come back to. We'll come back to that when we discuss uh, Freud and Jensch and the uncanny. Now, it says here on this slide, on the last slide, that next time we'll be diving into the uncanny. I better fix that. No, next time uh, we will be doing the Aliens and UFOs lecture, and you'll have another episode of Cosmos to watch for that, plus uh, reading through the nine-page report that was recently released uh, to the United States Congress uh, by the Pentagon, which details uh, their findings on unidentified aerial phenomena. What are they? How do we learn more about them? How do we understand what they are? Uh, and are they aliens uh, or, or what? Who knows, right? So that's what we'll look at next time. So sorry for the last minute change of plans, uh, but it's just easier uh, to have a lecture done this way and to get you all, uh, you know, learning something. So today has been astronomy or no, Today has been astrology and horoscopes, what they are, how are they supposed to work. I've just provided a bit of background about that, and then the rest of what you're required to do is watch and reflect on this documentary. This week's lectures, this one on astrology and horoscopes, and our next one on UFOs and alien life. Because I'm asking you to do so much reflection for the, uh, you know, for the documentary part, for your the stuff you have to watch rather than read, I think these would make very good topics for a future critical response or even an essay topic. So do keep that in mind as you go through these materials for this week. There's some very good potential uh, subject matter for your critical responses or for your essay. All right, so that is it for today. I hope this, uh, this week is a little bit easier on everybody. It certainly should be reading-wise. Uh, and I apologize for the old, cheesy 1980s documentary, but you know what? Um, it, really is, um, it really is a documentary that still holds up in a lot of ways. And the main thing I wanted to get you to see was the approach Sagan takes. Not mere debunk debunking, but communicating what's incredible and exciting about the way nature really works. So, you know, that's... 
Episode 3 from Cosmos, Harmony of the Worlds, that you'll have to watch. Or if you have the book, you could, I suppose you could also read Chapter 3. Yeah. Anyway, that's all for now. I'll see you all next time when we talk about UFOs and alien life. Bye for now, everyone. <laughs>